Hey, what's up to YouTube? It's your host, Devin Coleman, and I'm talking another vlog again for Northwest Fix and Flip. This one is really important. Uh, this one is a topic that you don't really hear a lot about in the detail that I'm going to deliver, but you do hear other perspectives uh, about uh, the process of fix and flipping uh, from other uh, contractors or people that are just involved in the flipping process. But this one, uh, you really want to stay tuned to really hear this and get involved in the discussion because this one's very important. This is going to talk about the demographics of people that get involved and uh, what you need to know before you become a flipster. And for those of you that have heard the word flipster but don't know what flipping is as a flipster, it's someone that goes and they borrow money, find properties at a wholesale they repair them and then they sell them for more than what they borrowed the money for. But then they got to get in and out at a short amount of time to be able to make money and do the work at a low price so that they don't have their cost overwhelm them so that they're not able to make a profit. So really stay tuned. Let's talk about this. This is a discussion that I want a lot of comments involved in this. I want to answer a lot of questions. And hey, if you know something that I left out, let's talk about it. I'm going to get to the living room. Let's talk. Okay, so, uh, okay, we're so we're now here back in, uh, inside, uh, from the outside. And um, there's a few things I want to go um, and talk about, go over in this vlog. So we, we talked about uh, the demographics, basically, um, just briefly, of the kind of people that are going to be involved in fix and flips. Um, so I'm going to have I'm gonna look at my notes here and um, just excuse my eyes from moving and checking out my notes. But it's things that I know about, but I wrote them down just so that we can stay on topic. I'm not going to be stuttering about it and I can just keep that flow going. Um, it's all about giving you the proper information because this is the stuff that you're going to need. Um, and for those that are doing it already, good job. But there's things that you may not know or things you may need to open your eyes a little more up on. Uh, for those of you that are just interested in it, great. This gives you some really information to really have another perspective um, of the do's and the don'ts. But just how, if you ever were to get involved in it, um, these are the things that you should focus on, what the mission is. This is about a mission. And then um, for those of you that may want to get into it in the future well then hey this is definitely what you need to be watching this is for you watch this definitely so i'm going to say across the board total spectrum it doesn't matter where you stand with this definitely watch this but if you're doing it or you're definitely interested and you're getting into doing it yeah uh, definitely let's talk about this so the demographics of people uh for what you should know when you become a flipster um Cash investors, uh, cash investors that hire contractors. Um, that's one that you got to be really careful on when you're doing um, uh, cash investing, fix and flipping. Uh, the other one is you're already a general contractor. So those are in the demographics of the people that are already doing it. And, you know, they're the people that do your kitchen remodels. Uh, they go out there and they do any of the carpentry work, finish work uh, in your house or your commercial facility, and then um, you hire those professionals to do that, and that's what I do. Uh, there's a difference in being a general contractor and an actual flipster. Uh, it's a whole different process, and I'll talk about why you really need to know what you should know about becoming a flipster, because it's a whole different process, and it's not just about the, the physical building aspect. It's about you really should focus on the business aspect of it first. Know it well, create a system, or don't get into it at all. It's not for you if, if you can't follow these few simple steps. And then the other one is the DIYs. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's do-it-yourselfers. Uh, the do-it-yourself for people, that's not a bad thing uh, because those people are smart in the sense that they're learning a skill or they have a skill. And you don't have to be a contractor to be a DIY person. Uh, I've seen some great DIY people, and matter of fact, they inspire me as a general contractor. But those people are 
in it to save money and make money. And that's a huge thing to do is to uh, make money. So when you're saving money, make money. Okay, so let's stick with the facts. The first one is the mission. When you buy a fix and flip, um, you're, there, there's two different uh, factors in um, fix and flipping. So uh, to flip properties, you're not doing anything but just buying the property at a wholesale value. And then you take that and you sell it to somebody else. So basically, there's an AB contract between you and the seller. So the seller could be someone in a distressed property. They could be getting ready to go into foreclosure from not being able to make their payments, um, just wanting to get out of their uh, their their home. Um, their home's not worth anything, so it's cash for homes. So basically, what you're doing is you find them a buyer. So what you do is you get under contract. You have 30 days to find a buyer, and you put down some earnest money, basically. Um, and the way it's set up between you and your lawyer or them and their lawyer, a lot of times the contractors use their own attorney where they hold the money there with that attorney. And they uh, they basically just have the paperwork up to where uh, this is held for 30 days and I have 30 days to sell your house. But from where it stands, I'm going to be your buyer. And that's an AB contract from the actual wholesaler to the actual seller, which is in distress or whatever their situation is. And then the wholesaler, that would be me, I would go out there, now that I'm under contract with the person that's selling their property, let's just say they couldn't make payments and they were getting ready to go into foreclosure, that's pretty common, so I'm just throwing that out there. That person would give me 30 days so that I can go find somebody, uh, to uh, buy their house. Now, how it works is hard money lenders or wholesalers, excuse me, it's wholesalers, they 90% uh, of the time put down only between 65 to 70% down. Uh, so basically, um, if the house was $100,000, I'm only going to buy that house for um, uh, 60000 or $65,000. So that means that there's between um, thirty five dollars to $40,000 I'm talking you down. I'm not buying it for retail on that markup. I'm buying it for wholesale because you have to remember when I buy your property, I take possession of it. I have to make sure that it gets repaired and then I have to pay all the closing costs. I have to pay for my listing agent that lists the property and they're expensive. And then they're at 3% and then your seller's agent or your buyer's agent. So the buyer's agent is the agent that comes in with a buyer for that property. So then you have to pay them too as well. So that's expensive. So you're looking at about 6% just on um, the, uh, the realtors coming in and uh, listing the property and then also bringing a buyer uh, to your property. And then you got your holding costs and, um, there's just other things that are involved in it that uh, financially that you're going to have to pay for. So uh, you have to, your renovation costs one. So I got to talk you down. I got to talk you down between 35 to 40 percent. Um, so um, I'm only going to buy it for between 60 to 65 thousand dollars. Then what I do is I find a buyer within that 30 days. I can find it the same day or a week later. And then. I, I do an a B, uh, a BC contract. So the AB contract is between uh, the wholesaler, me, and then the seller, which is the person in the distressed property. And then I find a buyer myself after I talked down the seller. And so with our AB contract, and then I get a BC contract, that's between me and the new buyer. And now I mark it up a little bit and then they take over. I close out the contract between me and the seller. And then I do a BC contract so they don't see what my profit is. I close them out. Now our contract is done. And then now it's between me and the actual buyer now. So they're gonna pay, they're getting paid off. I'm now with the other people that are buying for me. And then I turn around without having to do any renovations. I basically sell it, and that's what you call uh, flipping a property. 
you're taking me out of the contract that talked it down and I flipped the contract over to someone else. And so that's a flip. But a fix in flip is where you take a property that's distressed and you do a rehab. So you totally um, repair that property. And then you, with that rehab, it's called ARV, which is after repair value. So after the value of the, after the, the property is totally repaired, you have a new value. So say I bought it for a hundred thousand and I put $50,000 into it. Total investment is $150,000 for the sale of the property, purchase of the property, and then $50,000 for the rehab. So you're looking at total investment. This is just, I'm, I'm just coming up with numbers, not exact numbers, but just so you get the gist of it. So total investment is going to be $150,000 thousand uh, dollars and then let's just say after the rehab the arv the after repair value um now it's worth uh two hundred and fifty thousand dollars so guess what now that thing is worth um the profit on that is it's worth a hundred thousand dollars so uh i'm able to i'm able to make more money after the rehab on the property so now Instead of only getting like where I'm just wholesaling the property and I may walk away with between 15 to 20, I'm able to walk away with between 60 to $80,000 because I'm getting the money off the repair after I pay for the loan and then get my money back for the rehab of it. Um, I'm able to walk away and pay all the holding costs and the uh, listing agent and the, the buyer agent fees. Uh, I'm able to, you know, the title fees and all that too as well. I'm able to walk away between sixty to eighty thousand dollars instead of ten to fifteen thousand dollars just flipping the house. So there's very low risk when you're flipping a house. You take it, you talk them down, and you just find a buyer, and then they put all the money involved in it. You do nothing except for just a gift of gab, uh, basically talking to the uh, the seller and getting them out of the property. And a lot of times you're doing them a favor, uh, and then you. You get out of contract with them. You get into a contract with someone else, and then they buy it. Good to go. There's very little risk in that. But when you're fixed and flipping, there's a lot of risk in that because you've borrowed money. And when you borrow money, uh, the only way you can make money is that you have to get in and you have to get out. So let's talk about those things. So the mission is to buy at wholesale. You want to buy at wholesale, meaning there's no markup you are talking the property down so that you can make the money you're going from ground zero so that you can get as much as you can off of it just like the stock market you don't buy stocks when they're high because they're already ballooned out they're at their maximum you buy them at a low you buy tons of them and then when that profit goes when it goes up you sell it high and then when you sell it high or you cash out then you make a lot of money so you buy low, you buy them all low. Um, repair with uh, borrow money. When you repair with borrow money, be very careful. Stick with your budget. Always remember that any type of contingencies, add those in. Just add a little bit of extra in because they're always going to be that unforeseen. Uh, those are things that on a change order, there's an, it, there is a cap on a budget for a fix and flip. Because when you start going into your ARV, which is your, your aftermarket repair value, that is your profit. And when you start dipping into that, you're not making any money. If you're paying for all your front end, like your loan, your rehab, up oh, some incidentals I forgot, and then we had to pay for this, oh, there's more, now your profit starts to shrink. So you really want to focus on that. Um, you also have to remember you're borrowing money. If you're borrowing money for every single week that you're borrowing money and then there's also labor you have to add that labor up how much is the cost for supplies and labor every day add that up and then um, the uh, points cost for the hard money you could be paying thousands of dollars per week uh, on, a, on a fix and flip so um, be very careful you want to get in and you want to get out you don't want to be making payments on something you want to just borrow that money get in not have too many mistakes, very, very, very little, don't have any retail markup, and then you want to make sure that you maximize and get as much profit 
but you want to do it quickly. And it's the only way you can make money is get in and get out. Um, rehabs, I wouldn't want to do them for no more than 30 to 45 days. You look at those shows, uh, Fix and Flips, uh, from the the Home and Garden Network, and you see them uh, kind of within a, a, a quick episode put together a house that's about between 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, and you see them from beginning to end. But in that show, what they're not showing you is that's between 30 to 45 days, uh, sometimes even 60 days that they're doing that. You hear about the loan process, and the contingency is uh, plan for four months from when you purchase the home with the hard money, you are doing the renovation for 30 to 45 days, and then you are having time to put it on the market and then 30 days to close. So look to basically be working on that fix and flip for about four months. So they're not, they're income generators in the back end. But the scary part about doing fix and flips is that you have to have money in the front end so that you can get to your back end. So you have several months where you're not making any money. You're spending money. And it's almost like musical chairs. Everybody goes around and then there's somebody that has to lose. Well, if it's you that's the one that's losing, then you have no chair. You've done everything in vain. There's a waste of time. You shouldn't have even done it. Um, so make sure that when you're borrowing money that you, if you're fast, make sure you're faster. If you're slow, make sure you get faster. Don't take a long time to do uh, repairs on a home. So I don't like getting into big repairs, like a big remodel for like $100,000. Oh, it's a $100,000 remodel. Not if I'm the investor. Not if I'm the actual investor flipper contractor. You're losing money. And now if it's someone else that's an investor, and then I'm there just getting change orders off of them, I'm making money on the uh, the renovation of the house, not the sale of the house. But when I don't make my investor money because I'm slow, then that investor's gone. That investor, if they're smart, they're going to find another contractor. So that's not really sharp either. Even though you have less of a risk, you have more of a risk of your reputation uh, and, and um, keeping your clientele because you're taking forever. When you're not making them money, then they're going somewhere else. So that's smart on them, good for them. Uh, you want to make sure that within 30 to 45 days, like I just got through saying a recap, you're, you're, you've are you repaired the house and you're done. That's total completion of the house. And then it back on the market within 40 to 50 days that it's back on the market again and you're ready to sell it. Basically, before you make your first payment, it's already back on the market. You've already taken that time. You got a strong schedule. You have a contingency clause. You have everyone mapped out from your specialty people like your plumbers, electricians, all your cabinet work. Everything is already ordered because sometimes cabinets take three to four weeks. And with COVID, it's been taking six to nine weeks. So make sure that you're going with modular. Modular is already pre-manufactured cabinets when you're doing a fix and flip. Um, don't get too attached like it's your home. Just do some basics. Do some really nice looking ones, but do some basic ones that you don't have to put a lot of work into. They just look really decent. Be safe on your colors. Um, don't go all out and crazy because the more crazy you go out, that doesn't mean you're going to get a buyer for that. That just means that's more expensive for you. And at the end of the day, it's going to dig into your profit. So be careful on that. Um, but just make sure that you have that house back on the market within 40 to 50 days. Um, make sure that uh, you do it with quality. You like to get an offer between the first five to seven days. You want to get an offer so that you're in that 30 day under contract where you're getting out of contract with your investor or your hard money lender so that you've got a buyer now. You're now getting good profit. You've, um, you're getting out of the contract. And it's time to get paid. We're hitting that back end now. So really, really watch for that. That's that's important. Um, the other one is uh, you want to make sure that with your private lenders, 
you create a great re, uh, uh, relationship with them. It's all about relationships. You got to have really good, um, really, re really, really solid reputation. And the reason why I say solid reputation is uh, if you're late, you don't know what you're doing, or you have horrible quality, you could be cool all you want to. I just don't trust you. You're not someone that I want to do work with. I'm not going to hire you to do my fix and flips if I'm a cash investor or a hard money lender um, because I don't trust you. You're not someone that has a good reputation. Your quality is horrible. Uh, you're not able to sell the property to get out of the loan. You're not able to keep making money to make payments. So you're probably not going to be lending to you anymore. So make sure you deliver with quality and you deliver with speed. Speed because you're borrowing money, and the longer you borrow it, the more money you're paying out. Quality because you want to have a good reputation, but you also want people to like what you just got through delivering. You're selling yourself, and then you can get out of that contract because someone else fell in love with it, and then, boom, you're making a great profit, and then your lenders love you. You're getting uh, your sales quickly, and you're in and out, and you're on to the next one, and then... As we're creating that relationship with our um, private lenders, our, our hard money lenders as well, um, the, pro the, 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 the cost is going to go down. They know what you're about. We're going to create a relationship for a long time. So they know what you're about. So basically, I'm going to lend to you for less because we're going to be in this for the long haul. Um, very important. Uh, next one is... Um, ARV, again, means profit. So be careful with your ARV. Just because you have a cushion in your ARV, which is, okay, we bought the house for 100000 We put $50,000 into it. And now it's going to go, it's going to sell for uh, $450,000. So you got a lot of money in on that back end now that you're going to make. After holding costs, closing costs, your um, listing agent and your seller's, your, your buyer's agent's fees, you're, you're going to walk away with a lot of money still, maybe even $160,000. Um, uh, a lot of times in fix and flips, that's unheard of. But, you know, that's a really good number. And uh, when you look at how much uh, meat and potatoes you have on your ARV, oh, you know what, I think we can get these kind of countertops, these kind of cabinets. No, you're not doing it for that. You're doing it to make people go, I like it, I'm inspired by it, let's go. So you want to get like a decent line of, of vanities. You want to get a decent line of sinks and chandeliers. Your kitchens and your bathrooms and how many bedrooms is really going to make the value of that house go up once the repairs are delivered. So that's what's going to sell. If you got no kitchen space, that's going to be deal breakers for a lot because a lot of women go, mm, I don't like the kitchen. And it's not that women are always in the kitchen and this is the old uh, industrial age. I'm just saying that the kitchen is where the heart of the home is at. And a lot of the women, they run the house. And when they run the house, if they don't like the kitchens, then it's not it's a deal breaker. Uh, sometimes the yard is a deal breaker. Sometimes not having enough yard is, is a deal breaker or having too much work in the yard. Lots of trees, lots of bushes. Um, you want to take a lot of, uh, of the shrubs, bushes, and trees off the front of the house that have been there for the last 40, 50 years. Yeah, they're cool, they're pretty, but you want to show off that house. Anything to let people see the size of the house, the detail of the house, um, that house stand alone without any obstructions in the way. You want to get the eye of appeal, the curb appeal. You want to get the eye of, of appeal from all your buyers. Because you are the seller. Uh, let's go back to talking about the uh, the retail side of it. So as a general contractor, uh, it's very important that when you're a general contractor, you know the business end of fixing and flipping. You may do great work, beautiful work, but that doesn't mean that you're a flipster. Because if it takes you six to eight months to uh, and then sell that house... Um, that's not good. That's not good. You want to be in and out. You should be able to do a fix and flip in about 30 to 45 days. 
doing one for four months that you're a good you're a good general but you're not a money maker you you're losing money so remember that um having uh people come in a retail plumber electrician you might want to get a handyman plumber electrician or you might want to have a deal i know some of you electricians out there you're going to see this and you're not going to like what i have to say but these aren't your clients and guys those aren't your guys that you need for the specialty you should be able to buy all your supplies not for um, markup which is the retail cost but if it's three hundred dollars worth of supplies uh, that you can buy and then the the, the specialty contractor is going to mark it up to a thousand you're paying seven hundred dollars in retail markup well if you do that if you do that ten times that's seven thousand dollars in retail markup i don't want to pay for retail markup when i'm trying to sell the house for a retail markup i bought it for wholesale i'm here to make a profit so I'm here to sell it for retail. There can only be one king in the castle. So the more people that are coming in on a markup, they're not making money. Let's just say you made $100,000 and your retail markup was 25%. You just lost $25,000 because you're paying for somebody's overhead. You're paying for somebody's uh, logos on their truck, their, uh, their cell phone, their office space. Those are things that don't benefit you. So... I like to just buy my own supplies with no markup, and then I just like to have someone come in and install it, and then give me a great rate to install it, and I'm going to use you all the time on all of my fix and flips to do my specialty work. So this is a relationship I'm, I'm creating with you. This isn't a one in and one out, unless you're just not a good person, or this isn't, a, you just don't do good work. I'm trying to create a relationship with you. So it's very important that you watch the retail markup when you're trying to sell something, at you're buying it at wholesale, you're trying to repair it and sell it for a retail markup cost price for yourself. Remember, your after market repair value is your profit. And having guys come in and a lot of, I'm telling you, a lot of cash investors on the home um, uh, uh, rehab network, you see them, they put in about $150,000 for a rehab, and they only made about $33,000 for their ARV profit. That's horrible. They were losing more money during the process daily than they made. And when you're losing $1,700 a day and you're only making $500 a day, you're losing three times the amount. You really need to watch out what you're doing. So that's why I said you need to know the business end of it. You need to know who not to hire. Don't do Craigslist. Craigslist are a bunch of guys that do gigs that a lot of them aren't as skilled as they say they are. And when you do find somebody, make sure they're reputable, have a great reputation, that they know what they're doing, have their own tools and ability to go pick up supplies as well. Only use guys that are good. Don't hire major guy, key player guys, 15 bucks an hour to do your work in your house. Because I'll tell you right now, 25 to 30, 35 bucks an hour, um, that sounds more uh, doable uh, because those guys actually know what they're doing. The $15 an hour guys, they don't have tools, they don't know what they're doing. And I would be offended if someone hired me at 15 bucks an hour. So the guys that do it for 15 bucks an hour clearly don't know what they're doing. Just because they said yes, they're desperate, but they that's a telltale sign. They're not skilled. So you're not going to get a quality product. And you're going to be putting a lot of money of your rehab into garbage uh, labor. So don't do that. Uh, be fair about the pricing. If somebody wants to get 50 bucks an hour, then that's someone that needs to be able to get in and get out and do a great job. If they drag it out, they're slow and they're not as good. You're not worth 50 bucks an hour. That's what you want, but you're not worth 50 bucks an hour. So you have to weed those guys out too as well. Stay on your guys. Stay on your team. Uh, make sure that they're taking care of it in a timely manner. Remember, 35 to 40 day, uh, um, 30 to 45 days, 30 to 45 days, and you should be closing up. I don't take projects any longer than that. That's trouble. That's a trouble project and go sideways quick. And because you're a general, you know, when you got to do, you, you got to do great work. That's great. But again, time. If it takes you a long time, do it faster. Do it with quality. Um, uh, DIY people, because um, I said cash investors. Cash investors, hire people, contractors. Be faster at what you do. Know that you're borrowing money. Cash investors, make sure you're not paying a bunch of retailers. 
Make sure that the people that you have doing the work are people that do install, creating relationships with them, and that you're paying wholesale price because you're going to mark it up. Don't pay your electricians and plumbers top price, buy all the supplies, have them just do the install, and then keep them as a relationship. That'll save you money. And then the DIY people, the ones that do it themselves, great. Do what you can do, but do have some people do some other things because you can't do everything yourself. That will drag out the project. Then you're doing it yourself, but you're losing money because you're taking the four months to do it. And when you're borrowing money, you're losing money. Remember, if you're taking a long time. So, again, cash investors, watch out who you hire. Don't hire anybody at, whole, at retail. Hire them at wholesale. Contractors, just because you're a contractor and you may know what you're doing, Make sure you're fast and do good quality. And DYI people, hire some people to do some of the other stuff that you can't do or don't have time to do. Because if you're doing everything, you're going to drag the project out. So I think I hit all the key perspectives on what you need to know. It's very important. Um, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Those are things that you should comment on. And if you have something that I left out or a different perspective, I'd like to hear what you have to say. Don't bash just throw something else in because I think my information was pretty viable only because I've done it and I've learned how to make money in this program and that's doing quality and watching your time and watching the people that do the work with, with you. So retail people, you just don't work for me. It's wholesale only, baby, because I'm here to do the retail at the end. So um, remember... Uh, to uh, ring the bell so that you can get more of the future content that's coming out in the vlogs. And guys, I really appreciate you. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next vlog.